Um, so, as I'm sure most of you on the call are aware, uh, LDAP as an access protocol to directories has been around since the 90s, and it's still one of the key means for delivering security information to applications today. So there's little doubt over the importance of this model. Uh, however, what you'll learn during today's webinar is that old traditional LDAP storages are quickly becoming outdated as we move into the, the new era of the Internet of Things. Today I'll introduce you to the new HDAP storage, um, which is included with the latest release of our Radiant One suite. For starters, HDAP stands for Highly Available Directory Access Protocol. And the goal today is for you to get a glimpse of um, the new storage and the use cases for it. The first being a storage replacement for existing LDAP directories. And the second being a cache storage for our federated identity service. For those of you who aren't already familiar with our federated identity service, um, today's webinar will provide you with a brief introduction to the need for and some of the capabilities of this layer and how we see this architecture as being key for moving into the future and delivering context-driven services. Uh, lastly, I'm hoping to have about 10 minutes left for questions. So as Laura had mentioned, go ahead and enter them into your go-to uh, webinar screen throughout the webinar, and um, I'll address them at the end. Let's start by taking a look at HDAP and how it can offer a better alternative than traditional LDAP directories on the market today. The first aspect we'll take a look at is performance, um, because after all, one of the primary reasons of using a directory for security is speed. And directories have long been known for their fast lookups, primarily to uh, identify and authenticate users. In our performance test, um, we took one of the most well-known traditional LDAP directories, OpenDJ, and used it to assess and compare the performance of our HDAP store. At a high level, the results were, um, as you see here, for one node, one uh, instance of OpenDJ, was slightly faster than HDAP um, when it comes for searches. Update speeds were comparable between the two storages. And ads and deletes were 10 times faster against HDAP than OpenDJ. However, in a cluster architecture, so having more than one node, HDAP outperformed OpenDJ on all fronts. Um, this is mostly due to the block replication model that's leveraged by uh, the big data technologies upon which it was built. When it comes to the peer replication speed of this, um, the speed at which you basically reach a consistent image across all the nodes, HDAP is 50 times faster than OpenDJ replication. As a result of this, we've seen linear scalability up to nine cluster nodes. This chart uh, depicts the HDAP performance results. So for a cluster of three nodes, um, which is indicated with the blue line here, with 1,600 clients performing 80% searches, 10% modifies, and 10% adds and deletes, speeds reached about 75,000 queries per second. For a cluster of nine nodes, shown by the, the dark purple line here, um, with the same amount of clients, speeds reached 250,000 queries per second. So you might be thinking at this point, why and when would you ever need to deliver this level of throughput for traditional LDAP-based applications? So part of the topics today I'll introduce is how we at Radiant Logic see the future of our federated identity service uh, evolving from being used in, in just purely security to more data management and eventually a way to unify structured and unstructured data, servicing context-aware applications, not just LDAP applications. We're looking well beyond just servicing um, what is in place today in terms of LDAP applications. And this is one of the key reasons for our move to this new storage. It's easy to scale, and it can deliver huge throughput. When you look at uh, the performance throughput as the number of nodes in the clusters grows, um, you can see it scales linearly up to uh, at least three, excuse me, at least nine nodes, which is the maximum we tested, um, as we were already seeing 250,000 queries per second, as I mentioned. So just to give you an idea, I recently came across some numbers um, of the amount of searches that uh, Google performs per second that's handling right now, and it's about 70,000 per second. So reaching 250,000 is a massive amount of throughput, and 
actually at this range, we were starting to exhaust the bandwidth of the network. This graph shows um, the results of load balancing across a cluster of three HDAP nodes compared to three OpenDJ servers. So HDAP being the blue line here, OpenDJ the red. When you start to look at side-by-side uh, -side comparison between HDAP and OpenDJ, you can see that the number of, as, as the number of client connections grows, so shown on the x-axis here in this graph, um, even introducing a small amount of modify and add delete operations into the picture causes OpenDJ performance to start dropping dramatically. While the performance of HDAP, on the other hand, continues to remain stable. This is due to the more efficient block replication across the HDAP cluster nodes compared to the logical replication used by traditional LDAP directories. This graph shows that uh, the result of load balancing across five nodes in this scenario, five HDAP nodes compared to uh, five OpenDJ servers, you can see the same result than in the previous slide. Basically, when you increase the load and the clients are performing even a small amount of write operations in parallel to the search operations, the performance of traditional LDAP directories starts to drop dramatically. When you look at um, the efficiency of a, a B-tree index that's used in traditional LDAP directories like OpenDJ, indexing unique attributes so the ones that contain a single unique value across all entries, so something like a UID or a SAM account name, are ideal. The access plan here implemented um, is optimized for these types of searches. This graph shows that clients requesting um, the client requests containing filters associated with um, equality index attributes, unique attributes, perform slightly better than one instance um, of HDAP. This is related to the differences between the indexing methods used. Um, as I mentioned, vTree indexes used by traditional LDAP directories, they're optimized for filters requesting attributes that are unique. In addition, the more unique attributes requested in the, in the filter, shown at the, as the x-axis on the graph here, um, allow the directory to narrow down the result set and be even more specific in locating the matching entry. Indexing in HDAP, on the other hand, is based on an inverted index and is less selective. So it's not as optimized as B-tree for unique attribute equality searches. But the small amount of performance you lose here because of the implementation of the index affords you with many other benefits when the search filter starts to leverage things like substring index, um, searches on non-unique attribute values, which we'll take a look at next. As soon as the filters and the client requests start to leverage um, a substring operation, for example, uh, looking for a value that starts with a certain amount of characters, you'll see a significant drop in performance. Here, the inverted index used in HDAP is more efficient. Now, for authentication and issuing a search to identify a user, probably won't encounter too many clients using filters with a substring search. But for enforcing authorization, especially finer grained authorization where a lookup based on more than one attribute can be used, Here's where the flexibility of types of searches allowed by HDAP really starts to outshine traditional LDAP implementations. When you look at the results in, in this graph, um, it starts to become clear that HDAP allows for more flexible searches because the indexing structure is geared towards support for things like full text searches. Um, this allows you to benefit from indexing even on low cardinality attributes. And when you start to look at the profile attributes that you want to use to, for example, dynamically categorize users into different groups, things like title, department, location, uh, these attributes are not going to be unique across the entire user population. Also, it's oftentimes these attributes that policy servers need to access um, for enforcing finer grained authorization. So querying on attributes like these can kill a traditional LDAP server which is why directory administrators have tight control and constrain application owners on the types of queries that can be used. Performing um, substring or range searches on non-unique attributes doesn't make sense for authentication, but as I mentioned, for authorization, it's a totally different story. So here again is where you'll see the benefits of the inverted index. Uh, with traditional LDAP directories, there's always this trade-off between speed for fast lookups on unique um, entries 
and the flexibility allowed for subsequent searches for enforcing authorization. Uh, at the Gartner IAM Summit last November, Gartner had announced that um, this prediction by 2020, 70% of all businesses will be using attribute-based access control. So the industry experts here are forecasting that the future is attribute-driven authorization. So this means you must first have access to all the attributes, and then you need a flexible way to deliver this information. With HDAP, you have that same security layer that you're going to find in the traditional LDAP directories without the restrictions on the queries that can be issued. Um, although many LDAP applications today are, are read-only, um, and LDAP directories have always been known for being primarily used for fast searches to uniquely identify users, as I mentioned, for authentication. Um, but we've often encountered the need to support at least a certain amount of rights as well. These are generally for applications that manage and maintain session information or enforce some kind of password policy, managing things like last login or password validity, things like that. Um, from experience with our customers, and as our most recent performance results have shown, these applications will experience poor performance with their traditional LDAP server as volume increases. An example of an application that many of our customers use is uh, CA SiteMinder. And when deploying certain SiteMinder features like password services or persistent sessions, there are rights to the user account on every authentication. Uh, and when using SiteMinder Federation services, as an example, you're required. You're required to have a session store that can be written to. And the SiteMinder documentation even warns that these features can have a significant impact on performance with uh, traditional LDAP directory implementations. So what we're seeing is uh, one of the initial drivers for our HDAP storage is for large deployments of SiteMinder who are leveraging password services and, and persistent, session, persistent sessions. Um, they can greatly benefit from using an HDAP storage as opposed to a traditional LDAP directory because they're not going to experience that huge sacrifice in speed when write operations are being performed in parallel with searches. With Radiant 1, um, SiteMinder can point to a single logical directory where it can both write password services policy information and session information. The storage behind the scenes can be HDAP, but it can still appear like a classic LDAP, like a CA directory, for that matter, to, to SiteMinder. Um, this not only simplifies the SiteMinder configuration, but as I've mentioned, it's going to dramatically increase the performance. Oftentimes, uh, our SiteMinder customers have chosen to not even deploy features like the password services because of the known performance issues. Um, the graph here is just a reminder of what I talked about um, in the beginning. When the number of clients increases, the reason writes that are performed in parallel with searches, the performance of a classic LDAP directory is going to drop dramatically, whereas the HDAP performance will remain consistent. So for SiteMinder customers who are uh, deploying or looking to deploy these features, the persistent sessions or um, password services, they can leverage the HDAP storage in Radiant 1 and no longer need to worry about that drop in performance. When you look at uh, the classification of some of the most well-known LDAP servers used today, um, each directory supports the LDAP access protocol, but they all have very variations in their implementation of the storage. So indexes, default schemas, supported controls. Um, on the scale of LDAP directory implementation shown here, on one side we have the Sun directory, and on the other side of the, the spectrum we have Active directory. For all intents and purposes, HDAP appears to clients as a standard LDAP directory, and it falls closer to the side of Sun in terms of implementation. Um, most of the interest for our, from our customers when it comes to using our HDAP store is uh, an LDAP directory alternative. Um, it comes from those that are wanting to move away from Sun and into something more flexible with better performance. So, so far we've taken a look at um, some HDAP performance compared to a traditional LDAP directory like OpenDJ and where it falls on the scale of LDAP implementations. And now I'll introduce you quickly to a couple of different deployment architectures. 
Um, first, it's important to understand the notion of a site, which is defined by a, a local area network with good connectivity, so something running at speeds of one gigabit or better. On a site, you can have one or more clusters deployed. Now, what defines a cluster? Um, for high availability, with for high availability within the cluster, uh, a minimum of three nodes, shown in uh, the, the peach colored background here, is required. A load balancer, generally a hardware load balancer, directs the client traffic across the cluster nodes. Okay, and of the three core nodes, there will always be only one leader node, and the rest will be follower nodes. Okay. The leader or follower status of each node, by the way, is handled by Zookeeper, which manages the configuration consistency uh, for the entire cluster. If the leader node fails, a new one will be elected uh, automatically to ensure the integrity of the cluster. The consistency of the HDAP image across all the cluster nodes is addressed with block replication, and you'll see that um, in this diagram with the dashed arrows. And this replication flows from the leader node to all follower or follower-only nodes, as shown here in the diagram. So all changes to the HDAP data will be done on the leader node and then replicate it out to um, the followers. Within the cluster, um, follower nodes are available to become leaders should the currently designated leader node fail. And as I mentioned, um, the zookeeper will elect a new leader from the pool of the follower nodes. The follower-only nodes, the ones shown with the, uh, the blue background here, um, are special. They can never become a leader. They're just a lightweight node uh, that doesn't require the additional functions and features of a leader or follower node. And these types of nodes are added to a cluster to handle uh, more client load to improve throughput. And they're installed on the same site as the core cluster nodes. Another advantage of deploying a cluster is the ease and, and speed at which you can scale. Um, additional nodes, you can add them extremely fast. Once you install Radiant 1 on a new machine and indicate that you want to join an existing cluster, all the configuration files and the HDAP store data they're automatically applied to the new node, and it quickly becomes operational within a matter of minutes. If you need um, multiple sites, you need to have maybe multiple data centers or a disaster recovery site, you can deploy multiple clusters. HDAP stores um, deployed across more than one site will participate, can participate in an inter-cluster logical replication. Uh, this replication model supports multi-master, and it's based on the same model that traditional LDAP directories use today, where the current leader node in each cluster is responsible for accepting changes from all other clusters, and then these changes will be pushed out to other nodes within the cluster by way of the block replication that I mentioned. Um, okay, so as we've looked at so far, having this new advanced storage option is great, but how would someone even go about migrating out of their current storage? Remember, HDAP is just a new storage component of the Radiant One architecture, so you still have the complete virtualization engine as well. And in fact, it's this layer that you can use to rationalize your existing users and groups that are spread across your existing uh, data sources. And then when you have modeled and desire, you know, the desired views, the hierarchies, you would then persist them into the HDAP storage. Uh, Radiant One also has the complete synchronization engine to maintain the images from the back end for however long you need. Just because you want to uh, maybe migrate to a new storage doesn't mean that it's going to happen overnight. All the applications that are currently consuming those data stores are just going to immediately switch. So there may need to be a period of time where you can continue a sync process until you're ready to decommission the back end. And then at that time, the sync process can be turned off. And then the HDAP store will become the new authoritative source. Uh, but this is an essential piece for those of you looking to consolidate or migrate away from an older uh, LDAP directory deployment. Up until now, um, you've seen how HDAP is a new kind of storage that can be used to replace uh, your legacy LDAP storages of today. Um, but again, 
this storage is just a new component of the Radiant, of the latest Radiant One uh, release. Prior to version 7, the storage delivered with the product was uh, based on an open source LDAP directory. And then starting in version 7, uh, the storage is our own implementation based on uh, big data technologies like I've talked about, ZooKeeper and Lucene Solar. At its core, um, Radiant One is still the federated identity service that you require for your security initiatives like web access management and single sign-on federation. Um, so it's clearly in the security and identity integration space. During the next half of this webinar, um, you'll get a, a reminder, a refresher on uh, why you uh, need this layer for authentication and fine-grained authorization. Um, in addition, though, I'm going to introduce how this federated identity system is essential for application integration and even longer term context aware applications and semantic representations. As you start to understand the expansion of possible use cases, you can begin to see why having that uh, scalable, high-performing HDAP storage is an essential piece of the architecture. One of the biggest challenges companies are facing today is that the world of access keeps expanding. The user populations are expanding from employees to contractors, vendors, partners. On um, the application side, you're no longer looking at just applications on premise inside the corporate domain, but you've got partner applications, SaaS applications. Um, on the device side, you have to deal with not only enterprise computers, but more and more personal devices. So everything is expanding. When you start to look at um, solutions for federation, it's important to understand here that there are really two layers required for federation. One is the federated access layer, okay, the part that provides the token creation, the translation, and enforces single sign-on. The other part that's needed is the federated identity layer. You need to make sure your identity infrastructure is solid and complete, and that then becomes your foundation upon which you build your uh, federated access layer. The claims enabled, the federated applications shown at the top here, rely on and redirect authentication requests to an identity provider. So at a high level, it's the identity provider that's responsible for connecting to the data sources, handling the different data formats, the security means needed to authenticate the user. Uh, the identity provider then packages up this information about the user and you know, the fact that they are who they claim to be, then redirects them back to the application, which will now grant them access. The challenge here is greater than just federating your security and your access layer. You also have to federate your identity sources as well. Uh, the minute you start to have multiple heterogeneous data sources, all the challenges start to begin. Uh, each data source is going to store identity information differently, access through a different protocol, and in cases like this, the identity provider's job just got a lot harder. And I haven't even started to talk about potentially overlapping identities. So what happens if the data sources are not exclusive and a user has an entry in more than one of them? So now the IDP is not only able to connect to and handle different access protocols, understand the metadata, how to request authentication, but now they need to figure out how to address situations where a search for a user returns more than one entry. Is it the same person? If not, which one is the identity I need to verify the authentication for? And all this just be able to authenticate a user. With Radiant One in the architecture down at the bottom, uh, the burden of this identity integration is handled by an engine that's specifically designed for this task. And it allows the IDP to then just focus on the service it provides, like token creation and translation. The Federated Identity Service um, maps all the identity sources shown at the bottom to a common naming, and it creates the Identity Hub, which provides that global, unique list of identities to the IDP. So now the IDP has a single source to identify and authenticate the users. After authentication, uh, generally, the user's profile and or group information needs to be retrieved, as these are the attributes um, that are used to augment the claims and then become the basis for the applications to enforce authorization. So for this purpose, the Radiant One uh, Identity Service plays the role of an attribute store. 
Okay, it provides a, a common searchable schema. It maps all the objects and attributes into a common naming. And this alleviates the need for the IDP to have to understand how each data source defines an identity and which attributes pull from which source and how do I get the group information? Is it a nested group that I need to flatten? Or you know, all, all kinds of things come into issue here. It also provides um, added flexibility for defining groups. With Radiant 1, you can dynamically build groups based on any attributes of a user's global profile. If the criteria that you're using uh, to determine your group membership changes for a user, then they're automatically reflected into a new virtual group. So dynamically built virtual groups allow your users to be dispatched into new groups easily. And then this information can be used to populate claims, allowing applications to enforce finer grain security and even offer more uh, personalized services. When you start moving to cloud apps, um, you quickly see that you've also got additional provisioning challenges on your hands, because each application requires an aspect of a user's profile. Some cloud applications, like Salesforce, for example, um, support uh, just-in-time provisioning, where they can leverage what gets passed in the token to create the needed account locally. But this means what you package inside the token needs to be accurate and relevant in the context of the application. And what gets packaged inside the token, it has to come from some reference image for the identities. So once you put in place this federated identity architecture, um, it can be the reference image for provisioning to your application. Radiant One um, comes with full support of LDAP, SQL, SPML, SCIM, and REST APIs. And you can integrate this layer into existing provisioning products um, as a source or a target. So as I've mentioned, um, our federated identity service is being used today in the realm of security to build that reference image that provides a global, unique list of users, their complete profiles, and the rationalized view of groups. Uh, this list is obviously the source of authentication and an attribute store for retrieving group information um, and profile information for enforcing authorization. But another huge advantage of federating your identities is that now you can leverage this global ID to link back to all the local identifiers and have a key integration point for all your applications. Knowing who's who across the different data silos allows you to bring together all the specific aspects of a person okay, that have been collected by each of those applications maintaining those attributes. So this federated identity system that you're using for security is also your master identity table, your, your system of record which is essential for moving into application integration. Okay. So this moves you from that security realm, shown in the smaller bubble here on the diagram, um, into data management. Once you start to link the identities with their other related business contexts and start publishing many different views of this information, you're moving towards servicing context-aware applications. Okay, so at this point, you've moved well beyond the capabilities and usage of traditional directory servers and into the need for not only representing this information in consumable format beyond LDAP, but having a storage that can scale and deliver massive throughput. Having um, a federated identity is the start, and as I mentioned, it's key to security, but it also acts as an integration point. But then the question becomes, well, why do you need a hierarchy as opposed to a SQL relational database model or even NoSQL? After all, isn't the whole world running on a relational model today or looking to move to a NoSQL model? Um, the bottom line is that from any relational model, you can generate a graph, which can be decomposed into a directed graph, which can further be decomposed into a directed acyclic graph, which is ultimately what a directory tree represents, a way to navigate in a, in a directed way. Some of the benefits of using a relational model for storage would be, well, for starters, the information is non-redundant, it's easy to maintain. In addition, you have a lot of flexibility because you could generate many graphs and many directed graphs from these schemas. But the big downside of navigating and, and traversing these relationships dynamically is that it's taxing and slow. However, if you had a way to extract and understand the existing relationships, model-driven hierarchical views from the data 
you could generate those and then persist that into a storage that's highly scalable and can give you massive throughput, you basically have the best of both worlds. And here with Radiant One, with the identity and context virtualization capabilities and the HDAP storage, you get exactly that. Um, if you're interested in diving further into this topic, I've referenced some uh, good blog links where Radiant Logic's Michelle Prompt covers this topic in, in great detail. As I mentioned, the biggest downside of navigating the relationship in a SQL database today is, is the time it takes you to do this operation. However, with this relational model, Radiant One is able to extract the different objects and relationships and then link the federated identity to this information. So the different views or the hierarchies that can be produced from this information is unlimited and can be navigated and queried at high speed because it's persisted in the HDAP storage. So moving from a relational model to link common identities and build all kinds of hierarchical views is addressed by the identity and context virtualization layer in Radiant 1. You see the, the blue cylinder here and then the, and the arrow. And then consuming this information at high speeds is the benefit of the HDAP store. So you see the, the orange colored triangle here over on the, the graph, the hierarchy uh, node on the graph. When you look at the complete architecture, you have um, the existing data silos on one side, so over on the left, which get fed into some kind of a profile integration engine, which is ideally, as I mentioned, a database. Um, then the database, from there, the profile delivery engine generates all kinds of context-driven views, which then get materialized into the HDAP store. From here, the information is consumed by a variety of different applications, so shown over on the right-hand side, and using whatever protocol they choose. It may be LDAP, SQL, REST, whatever the flavor of the day is. Here's an example of a data model, um, similar to what you would find for a services company like a uh, cable or phone. Um, there's a billing database containing related tables like services, customers, and information about uh, current rate and account balance. And then you have a, a serviceability database, which stores objects defining an address and the available services. At the bottom, you have a glimpse of a provisioning database, where there's a subscriber object linking to particular services and devices. Okay, so this is what you would, what you would deal with today in the actual uh, back-end data system. So the next couple diagrams um, present a quick introduction to the, the methodology for building a federated identity service that leverages the um, existing context and relationships to build user profiles. So like in the example uh, we saw on the previous slide, each repository stores its information in its own particular format, accessed in its own protocol. Um, so the capability to extract the metadata from each source and create a common object model is a key capability of the Federated Identity Service. This is always the first step, and it's the basis for performing um, the services that are offered by Radiant One. So the object and attribute mapping, aggregation, correlation, joining, view design, this is where it all starts. Uh, for starters, the, the metadata, the metadata, excuse me, that you extract from each system, um, you now have a list of identity attributes that uh, serve as the basis for defining some correlation rules and linking the common accounts across the system. So down at the bottom of the diagram here, you see that global data model, and then the identity correlation and linking shown with the dashed lines here. After the common accounts have been linked, many different views of identities can be defined to serve a variety of applications each one getting a view that's catered to their specific needs, accessible through, like I said, the desired protocols they want to use. So initially, to meet the needs of authentication and authorization, your views may consist only of a, a unique list of users and their associated profile attributes with group memberships. But there's no limit to the number and types of views you can define from the metadata. So this layer you put in place for your security can easily be reused for other purposes. You're maximizing your return on your investment here.
one thing I wanted to quickly mention too in terms of um, access protocols is that even though today the majority of our customers, I would say, still use LDAP as the protocol to access the Federated Identity Service, um, it's quickly becoming outdated. And the trend is to deliver the information via a REST interface. Uh, for this purpose, Radiant Logic has created what we call the Adaptive Directory Access Protocol. Um, this API is open source, and it allows you to have a REST interface on top of uh, any LDAP directory. It supports all LDAP operations and the ability to navigate the directory tree. Wrapping these operations and the progressive disclosure capabilities that exist inside um, LDAP directories today into a REST interface opens this up to the web. Um, by the way, it's also this REST interface is uh, what we use for HDAP. So this is ADAP is the REST interface to HDAP. And um, we're in the process of presenting this API to Kantara right now to get it approved as a standard. The last thing I want to cover today is um, an example of an application that can consume context-driven views delivered by Radiant One. Uh, the sample application that we include with our product, and the one I'll be showing you some glimpses of today, is called Context Browser. The Context Browser, which you see here, um, the interface to, is a sample application that uh, showcases the ability of Radiant One to gather, organize, and represent the different business contexts that exist within um, the data. And it gives you an idea about how applications can consume it. From within Context Browser, um, you can actually search for a keyword, and the result will be a set of sentences describing the context around that keyword. The context-driven view uh, used in the example shown here is based on an HR database, a CRM database, and an orders database. An employee, who in this example happens to be Nancy DeVolio, is a sales representative, and the great outdoors is one of her accounts. So for Nancy, directly I can see profile attributes linked to her HR records. So things like first name, last name, photo, title, phone, email. And by linking Nancy's HR record to her record in the CRM system, we're able to show you details about a customer account that Nancy is in charge of, in this case, the great outdoors. Then by clicking on that specific customer account, I can reach past orders that they've placed. Okay, and I'm, we're able to show you um, specific order details as well, and you'll see that in more details in just a second. But the context browser is actually depicting three levels of context here. So over on the, the left, you see the, the different categories. Um, the context field basically describes the current context in which the keyword was found. Uh, so as you can see, that they're in the form of uh, human readable sentences. Okay, now I have to find the, the verbs myself, so um, they're kind of uh, rough. But for all intents and purposes, you can read it. The sentence field represents a specific situation. So sales representative Nancy DeVolio has account the great outdoors, okay, the specific context that has been selected. Then the form field shown at the bottom is representing the specific details, so the attributes about the subject and the object that the context is comprised of. And these are the objects that you reached in a specific context. It's not just details about any customer account, for example, it's the great outdoors, who Nancy DeVolio is the account rep for. By navigating the relationships between um, the customer accounts and the orders they've placed, you can see here that the great outdoors purchased order number 21, and the attributes directly linked to the order, like the order date, the shipping address, contact information. So again, I'm, I'm browsing and navigating through the context and getting um, uh, more information as I, as I dive further on. So once you've searched for and selected a specific target, um, meaning that the, the scope of the data is reduced to only the relevant information about that target, you can start to browse, as I mentioned, the, from this target to discover other related contexts. So, for example, I can see that Order 21 contained a specific product named Conestoga, and this is a type of backpack. Without the support of all that metadata I talked about that we captured from the beginning and, it's a, and Radiant One's ability to build the sentences based on the relationships across this metadata, you wouldn't be able to deliver the objects like this in the proper context that we're seeing it in this particular example. 
Okay, some important takeaways, and then I'll move on to your questions. Um, starting in Radiant 1 version 7, the, the included storage has changed from uh, traditional LDAP to our own implementation based on uh, big data technology. The storage is highly scalable. It delivers performance speeds that far surpass traditional LDAP directories, uh, especially in cases where clients issue parallel searches and write operations. Um, with this HDAP store, you get the same benefits as classic LDAP directories without the drawbacks. It can deliver the consistent performance, and no matter what attributes are requested in client queries, um, and even if the values are not unique across the user population, you'll still get that consistent performance. This makes it obviously equipped to deal with not only the security use cases that we see today, um, delivering the services like the authentication and authorization, but it puts in place an infrastructure needed to move toward better data management and servicing context-aware applications. Uh, with the Radiant One Federated Identity Service layer, you build that reference image that provides a global unique list uh, of users, all their profiles, a rationalized view of groups, and with this approach, you benefit from an entire set of wizards and GUI tools that help you do the aggregation, user correlation, uh, define which attributes you want to comprise the profiles, what sources they should come from, and then decide what to do about groups, existing groups, build new groups. These user profiles, this federated identity, can also be linked to other related business contexts across the enterprise, like we saw in the, the context browser um, example. So the end result is a, a complete list of users, groups, and associated contexts that's going to help you simplify, like I mentioned today, moving to the cloud and be reused for other initiatives. It's something that you put in place today, and it easily allows you to adjust to new requirements in the future. Okay. With that being said, uh, let's open the floor up to some questions. So the first question, let's see here, give me a second. Why would someone use uh, ADAP, the, the new REST interface, uh, instead of SCIM? Well, that's a good question. The SCIM standard was created to simplify user management in the cloud, and it already defines a schema for representing users and groups um, and supports the, the needed the crude functions for these objects. Um, but the main reason we invented the REST interface for LDAP is because SCIM is too limited. We wanted to support a REST interface to any object, not just users and groups. Um, like I talked about today, we envision the usage of um, our federated identity service expanding beyond security, beyond just focusing on users and groups, and being able to virtualize any kind of objects. Like I discussed um, when I talked about the, the context-driven views, where we can link unique identities to all their related business contexts. Uh, so linking the user, my user Nancy DeVolio, to the customer object, linking the customer object to the orders, to the products, et cetera. So one thing missing in SCIM today, too, is the ability to navigate the hierarchy like this, the tree. So one of the benefits of um, a directory is having this hierarchy and the, the progressive disclosure capabilities of it. So we wanted a REST interface that not only wrapped the LDAP objects, all LDAP objects, but was able to navigate the hierarchy as well. So hence the birth of, of ADAP and um, why you would need that over SCIM. Next question here. What kind of indexes does HDAP support? Um, as I talked about today, HDAP very closely mimics uh, some directory implementation. So all the same types of client queries that leverage the default index is supported by Sun, so your presence, uh, equality, approximate, substring, matching, rule, browsing, those will all work against HDAP as well. And in most cases, HDAP will perform faster. Uh, just a reminder, though, that, that the differentiation of these types of indexes to begin with was due to the implementation of vTree, which requires creating those additional indexes to handle uh, more efficiently certain types of queries. The indexation used by HDAP, however, is uh, designed to be more flexible and efficient because it's the engine behind full text searches. So a directory administrator no longer needs to worry about what kind of index to define for which attributes, because with HDAP, all the attributes can be indexed. 
and not only uh, will all queries that um, is, that are issued by some of your traditional LDAP clients work with HDAP today, but it can also support uh, full text searches. These types of searches are no longer linked to um, specific attributes, uh, as the characters requested could be found in any attribute value. And an entry will be returned if any attribute in the entry contains the character string requested by the client. So again, HDAP offers the same functionality that classic LDAP directories do today, but with the additional flexibility to support all kinds of client requests in the future. Okay, question here. Can VDS connect to and virtualize Hadoop, um, HDFS, as a data source? Uh, the answer to this, yes, it can. Um, HDFS is a storage for all kinds of structured and unstructured data, big data. So imagine linking the global identifiers uh, designed with the Federated Identity Service to this data and then being able to navigate it in a meaningful way. So in the context browser example um, I showed you today, you saw that unique identity, in that case it was Nancy DeVolio, and how a virtual view could be built to allow you to navigate to all her customer accounts, all the orders they've placed by a particular customer, um, all the products in that particular order. This is an example of, of navigating uh, the links and relationships across um, a structured set of relational databases. But I also could have mounted a child branch into this view definition representing HDFS and linking Nancy to other unstructured data like documents as well. So again, just another example of something well beyond the scope of today's traditional LDAP directories. Uh, will this session be available for access later? Uh, yes, definitely. The recording will be available. Um, should be up on our site tomorrow, and you'll uh, receive an email within about 24 hours. Is nine nodes the scalability limit for HDAP? Um, to be honest with you, nine nodes was the maximum we've tested at this point. So I can't give you an exact number of how far you can go here. Uh, as I mentioned, with nine nodes, you're already seeing performance in the range of 250,000 queries per second. So if you needed to go beyond that and adding additional nodes, um, from what I can tell in our, from our existing performance numbers, it should be fine. Uh, but just to let you know that uh, nine is the maximum amount we tested with today, and as I also said, that even after that point, we were already taxing the bandwidth of the network. So moving beyond that, um, testing beyond that didn't make sense at the time. What is your definition of federation in this presentation? Federation for me and that us at Radiant, there's two different things. There's the federated access layer that I talked about. So within a federation architecture, you've got a, a layer or a, a component that needs to be able to handle things like token creation, token translation, managing the single sign-on session. And you also need to consider your identity. Okay? If you have one identity store and everything's perfect and clean and in that single location, your identity provider's job is pretty easy. It knows exactly where to go to authenticate people and pull attributes and pull group information. But a lot of times, and for our customers who are primarily Fortune 1000 companies, they never have just a single source of identities. They've got multiple sources of identities. And in a lot of scenarios, have overlap of user accounts. So now, what Radiant um, calls the federated identity layer, being able to handle and address the needs of an overlapping identity population, being able to connect to and rationalize these existing identities and um, existing groups as well. Because a user, if they have more than one account, want more than one data source, oftentimes they've got, they're a member of groups in those data sources as well. So being able to understand not only that a person is the same user to begin with, but also be able to build a rationalized view of all of their groups. Okay? These are all the things that are important and essential for federation, that just by implementing an IDP layer the way that it stands today, you don't get that. You don't automatically get identity correlation and group rationalization. 
All right, that's why breaking it into a federated access layer and a federated identity layer as both uh, as being both needed for federation. So when I talk about federation in today's presentation, I'm basically breaking it down into those two different components. Federated access can be delivered by uh, any number of, of products on the market today. You've got Ping, you've got Okta, you've got lots of different um, IDP layers, OpenAM. Um, the federated identity part of it, that's under, underneath essentially the IDP, is something like you need the, the federated identity um, service that Radiant is providing for. Also, as I mentioned, for um, federation, being able to deliver the right attributes and the right context to the right application is also essential. So once you have that uh, unique list of your identities, being able to assess and deliver the right attribute information, the right group information to the right uh, application is going to be essential. And IDP by itself can't do that. Okay? So that's why you need both of the layers for this. Is HDAP a standalone product, or does it have to work with SiteMinder? Um, HDAP, if you look within the Radiant One product, okay, um, there's different components involved. There is uh, an identity and context virtualization functionality, so a, a virtual directory piece, if you will. And there's also other things. There's a synchronization engine. Um, and one of the pieces within this is a storage. Now. Um, and we've always offered a storage in our product because being able to uh, deliver the types of views that we're generating with our product at speeds expected by the client applications, you have to be able to do that fast. So having some kind of a persistent storage to cache these um, hierarchical views has always been essential to us. Okay? Um, in previous versions of our product, that storage was a traditional LDAP implementation. Starting in version 7, we switched over to our own implementation of the storage, which we call HDAP. All right? um, HDAP is built within Radiant 1. All right? So when you ask, is it a standalone product, I would just describe that within our product, Radiant 1, the Federated Identity Service, the storage piece is HDAP. And you can use that as, um, like I mentioned, an LDAP alternative. So if you want to use the storage as a directory replacement, that's an option for you. Uh, we always use that now today as our persistent storage for our cache. Um, does it have to work with SiteMinder? SiteMinder was just an example of an application that leverages an LDAP directory today to authenticate users and retrieve uh, profile attributes, group information. So SiteMinder is not required in any way to use our product. It was just an example of an application that uh, currently today consumes an LDAP directory that could work with our HDAP storage as well. And uh, during today's presentation, I talked about how within SiteMinder there are certain features that require rights along with um, authentication. So for the password services or the persistent sessions that are leveraged by SiteMinder, this is an example of where you've got an application that's going to be performing parallel search and write operations. And when you do this against a traditional LDAP directory, performance is going to degradate rapidly. So by replacing your SiteMinder implementation that currently may today point to a traditional LDAP server with Radiant 1, you can implement these services at the level of SiteMinder and not have to sacrifice your speed. So hopefully that, that clears it up. SiteMinder was just um, one example of an application that uh, today points to an LDAP directory and um, can use that storage for authentication, searches, in addition to write operations. There's a lot of questions about uh, the server specifications from the performance tests um, that we did. And um, I can get you that uh, after today's call, I'll give you a, a summary of the types of machines that we're running in our test environment um, to give you an idea of what's, what would be required to reach the same throughput. Any known issues of HDAP working with Kerberos? Um, for the storage, so you have the storage, which is the HDAP component. And then on top of that, you have um, the existing Radiant 1 identity and context virtualization. 
when it comes to the support for Kerberos, it's the same as it was in previous versions of Gradient. So nothing's changed here. You can still, um, applications can still access Radiant 1 as a Kerberized service, so it does support uh, Kerberos for authentication from clients. And um, if you are using Radiant 1 as a uh, proxy mechanism to a backend Active Directory, Radiant 1 can act as a client, a, Kerberi a Kerberos client, to a backend Active Directory as well. So the support for Kerberos hasn't changed from previous versions of Radiant. So with the introduction of HDAP and, and version 7, um, that still is consistent. Okay, lots of other good questions. Um, as Laura had mentioned, we'll get to those in an email response after today's webinar. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and close things out. Uh, as I mentioned, so a link to today's presentation will be emailed to you. Uh, it takes about 24 hours. And then um, those of you who have questions that didn't get answered, we'll follow up with you directly through an email. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. And I uh, hope to see you and hope you guys attend a new, uh, another webinar of ours in the future.